was going to give us a national real estate and economic outlook. We also have Keith Watkins, who is with the Arizona Commerce Authority. He's going to give us a state and a northern Arizona current and future economic outlook. We're excited to be with you today. We're excited for this opportunity to, to sharpen our skills and, and learn a little bit more about those things contributing to the economy. Next, I want to introduce PARS president, Jeff Bashaw, to say a few words. Thank you, Matt. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, I wanted to uh, uh, let you know here at PAR, we are so thankful to Dr. Lawrence Young and Keith Watkins for being able to join us and share with uh, us their knowledge. Um, I, I've had the, uh, the pleasure of listening to uh, Lawrence live on uh, three different um, uh, conventions, uh, Washington and, and Boston and Chicago. Um, and so, and I'm getting, I, I'm really thrilled to listen to uh, what Keith has to say. So um, let's get to it. Uh, a big thank you to the Prescott Area Commercial Group and the Women's Council of Realtors for uh, part uh, partnering with us to bring this announcement, um, our special event to you. Before we get started, I would like to make a few announcements. Um, our annual installation and awards event is next Friday, October 16th, and that's from two to four. You'll be able to join us virtually or live in person, so we're doing kind of a hybrid thing, and uh, we're hoping that that works out really well. If you would like to join us in person, make sure to register. Uh, right away because seating is limited for more info uh, for more info please look at our event calendar on the new par website par has all classes including the ce classes for free right now and all designation classes at a discount so uh, take advantage of those make sure to check your par calendar and uh, again you can find that on the par's new website www.paar.org um, it's a brand new site, and uh, it's, it's a gr great improvement over the last one, so I, I think you'll enjoy uh, jumping around in there. Uh, read your weekly update that Dan sends out every Saturday, and make sure you are following us on social media to find out which classes and events are coming soon. So once again, thank you all for being here today, and uh, it's amazing we can accomplish what we can accomplish when we all work together. I'm really excited for this. Um, you're going to get uh, a lot of great information. So uh, I am going to turn it back over to Matt. And thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that. I'd like to introduce Dr. Lawrence Young. Lawrence is the Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of Research at the National Association of Realtors. He oversees and is responsible for a wide range of research activity for the association, including NAR's existing home sales statistics affordability index, and home buyers and seller profile report. He regularly provides commentary on real estate market trends for its 1.4 million realtors. Dr. Yun creates NARS forecasts and participates in many economic forecasting panels, among them the Blue Chip Council and the Wall Street Journal forecasting survey. He appears regularly on financial news outlets and is, free, and is a frequent speaker at real estate conferences throughout the United States. He also participates in the Industrial Economist Discussion Group at the Joint Center for Housing Studies of Harvard University and has appeared as a guest on C-SPAN's Washington Journal. Dr. Young received his undergraduate degree from Purdue University and earned his PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park. Dr. Young, I turn the time over to you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Matt, for the uh, introduction and inviting. And I'm glad to uh, see uh, that uh, the commercial group, the Women's Council, can all join together uh, with the Prescott Association of Realtors uh, to bring this event uh, happen. Uh, thank you, President Jeff. Uh, in your, uh, I mean, I always appreciate the local association uh, presidents. So, you know, we have realtor members all across the country. So many advocacy uh, issues, and, and you are leading the charge. Uh, in getting many things done. Let's go back to March of, middle of March. Uh, in fact, you know, I was looking forward to the March Madness basketball tournament, uh, but it didn't occur. So that is my timeline as to when the pandemic lockdown occurred. Uh, and in the first few weeks, you know, it was quite a scary time. Uh, we really did not know what this meant, uh, how bad it will get. Uh, first on the virus, 
Uh, we saw the imagery coming out of China and then Europe, uh, people in ventilators, hospitals, the death figures. So as a realtor, you have to visit uh, strangers' properties. And if you touch a doorknob and accidentally touch your face, is that a death sentence? Uh, you know, we didn't know, know about the social distancing measure uh, and such. Uh, and the second uh, part was with everyone forced to stay at home, how are you going to conduct business? Uh, and if no one is going to buy a home, you have your own personal mortgage to pay. So potential financial devastation. Well, here we are in early October, and on the virus front, well, it's not yet contained, but at least we know, uh, you know who is more vulnerable, how we can minimize you know, wearing the mask, social distancing, all that part. And regarding the real estate, wow, what an incredible recovery on the residential housing. I cannot say the same thing on the commercial real estate, but on the residential, it is quite surprising and remarkable as how things have played out. As an economist, I speak better with PowerPoint slides, so let me put that onto the chart at the moment. Hold one second. All right, here we go. So let's first start with the overall economy, and it is an off-the-chart collapse in the second quarter. Um, this is not somehow there was something wrong with the U.S. economy. It was simply a government dictate to say, shut it down. So uh, once we shut it down, the economy collapsed by more than 30 percent. Now, as the governors have reopened the economy, we are getting more activity. And therefore, the upcoming data on the broad economy, GDP, in the third quarter will show quite sizable off the chart positive of growth that will occur, possibly plus 30%. And it will come, come, that data will come out at end of October, essentially a few days before the election. Whether or not it makes any difference on people's voting choices, I don't know. Uh, I hear that a number of people are undecided is essentially a uh, you know, small single digit uh, percentage, uh, but the number that will be coming out a few days before the election will be uh, quite a strong uh, GDP number after the collapse in the second quarter. Because of the economic collapse, the government was all in to help revive the economy. Central bank, the Federal Reserve, maximum liquidity policy, meaning that interest rates on the something called Fed funds rate went down to zero. Quantitative easing, that's government purchasing mortgage-backed securities. You don't have to know all these technicalities. What you need to know is that mortgage rates are at an all-time low. So the end result of the maximum liquidity policy is that mortgage rates are averaging 2.8, 2.9% on a 30-year fix, just incredibly low mortgage rates. In addition to the central bank's actions, the Congress and the White House are always trying to pro provide us a stimulus. If you remember the $1,200 stimulus check, additional amount for dependent family members, and also the enhanced unemployment insurance. So enhanced such that if you are working as a cashier at a department store and got laid off, the unemployment check amount was actually larger than the wages you, the person was receiving. So very enhanced unemployment insurance for small business owners, the loans that was available, which if you meet certain criteria, like you know, paying salaries, paying rent at this percentage, you don't have to repay that money. So massive stimulus put into the economy as well to revive from the big collapse that occurred in the second quarter. Now let me quickly turn to data that is not economic, GPS mobility data, and two states that is not Arizona, Utah and New York. I show these two states because they are the most contrasting states. Everyone has a cell phone, and if you are staying put at home, it shows no mobility. But if you are moving out and about town, the GPS is showing that you are moving around. So what is this chart showing? So before the pandemic, we have a reference line of zero. Then during the lockdown, you see that both GPS activity in two states go down. But Utah decided to reopen their economy sooner and are so in more relaxed way. While in New York, Governor Cuomo said, I wanna kill the virus, stop the spread. 
So he had much longer lockdown and more stricter lockdown. Even today, the restaurant owners in New York City are screaming to say they may be permanently out of business forever. So you see the mobility where Utah is showing more mobility compared to New York. In terms of the virus, New York, after the initial flare up, uh, it appears to have largely contained very little activity. While in Utah, they are hitting highs in terms of new cases. Now, fortunately, with better medical advances, more knowledge, people who are getting those new cases, the death potential is much, much lower now compared to the early part back in March and April. But still, I hope no one catches it. People follow social distancing, mask, whatever. Uh, but you know, be careful uh, out there. But the containment of the virus is coming at a cost. And here's the cost. One can see it in the unemployment rate. So the bottom line is Utah in this case. Unemployment rate has now slid back down to 4% in Utah, while in New York, unemployment rate remains elevated at 16% and not falling. 16% unemployment rate, this is like the Great Depression level unemployment conditions. So yes, they are able to contain the virus, but it's coming at a huge economic cost. What is the right trade-off? I don't know. Every governor is deciding on their own uh, as to what it could be. But if we look at Arizona, Arizona looks like the following. Unemployment rate in Arizona at 5.9%, so much lower than the rest of the country. So Arizona is, in a sense, following something more like Utah rather than New York. While California is more like uh, New York with a very strict lockdown, longer period of lockdown. Nevada and Hawaii, just because they are tourism dependent, they just have high unemployment rate for that reason. So the interesting part is 50 states in the United States had very low unemployment rate, very similar low unemployment rate before the pandemic in February. Now we see wide divergence depending on which policy that the governors pursue. As related to the job market, over the past 20 years, the chart shows the following. Let me go to the middle of the chart that you see that little hump. That little hump is subprime-led economic boom followed by crash. And Arizona was clearly ground zero for some of the foreclosure crisis America experienced. But from the low point in 2010, America had the longest economic expansion ever, 10 straight years of job creation. 10 straight years. And in a single month of April, all that jobs lost. Consider 10 years of job creation gone in a single month. But that was a government imposed lockdown. But as you can see in the more recent dotted uh, line that you see on the latest month, we are recovering jobs as the economy is beginning to reopen, phase two, phase three, phase four, and so forth. But we are only halfway recovered. We need to go far more in terms of getting us fully back to normal. Let's look at the Prescott region, what the figures looks like. Well, you see that in the middle of the chart, that hump, subprime lending boom, followed by the foreclosure crisis, and then 10 years of job creation. And with the economic lockdown, Prescott really did not, did not go down that deep. And you are almost back up to the prior peak. There's another interesting point. Let me go back to the US just for a comparison. See that red line that you see? That's the year 2000 to show reference. So I'm gonna go back to the US. Here's the US. Year 2000, subprime crisis, foreclosure crisis, uh, and then April of this year, lockdown, and now bouncing back. But Prescott is consistently above the red line, which is indicating that Prescott is showing faster job growth compared to the rest of the country. More people moving into Prescott region, compared to people moving out, so you are doing relatively better. I also want to highlight the nearby major city of Phoenix metro area, Scottsdale, Mesa uh, region. Uh, so you see also that red line is consistently above. So a very large city, uh, Phoenix, is also consistently outperforming the rest of the country. And this is important because you may begin to see more people who have employment in Phoenix begin to live out in Prescott. I know that already happens, but that trend could actually accelerate 
which means that housing demand, even commercial real estate demand uh, for retail spaces. If you are running a downtown uh, lunch counter, I mean, it's a devastating. But if you are trying to do a new business uh, out in the suburbs, there may be some potential because people are working from home and not going to downtown centers. Uh, so you see that Phoenix will continue in job growth, which is a positive, but people may not be living in Phoenix. They may be living in uh, Prescott and other farther away regions where homes are more affordable. Maybe they can get a larger size homes. Uh, so that trend could clearly develop. Let's see what the job losses have occurred. It's primarily in people who work in the hotel restaurants. We all know that. Home construction, it did not budge all that much, and I think it will soon turn positive because we need to build more homes. Office employment of people working in finance and insurance is actually positive. And if you look at the weekly earnings, the green bar, it is the low wage industry, leisure, hospitality, retail that really lost jobs, where construction uh, and finance, you see higher pay, uh, so people are talking about this K-shaped recovery to say that people who are in higher income category fairly immune during the pandemic. People who own a home, they are seeing rising values. Uh, people uh, who have exposure to the stock market, seeing wealth gains. Uh, people who are just struggling uh, at the minimum wage, they have lost jobs, uh, they don't have any wealth gain. So we are in a divergent economic path between those you know, who are on the better condition versus people uh, who are uh, in a more challenging uh, condition. One other thing for policymakers to consider, including governors, county commissioners, uh, is to see if those people who lost job in restaurant and hotel, if they could get some vocational training to go into construction. First, there's plenty of job that will be opening up in construction. And second, it pays a lot more. So maybe if there can be something to be done about it, you know, it certainly be a win-win situation. Personal income. This is the total income for the country as a whole. You add up everyone's salaries all together, generally rise around 4% each year. So people on W-2 income rising about 4% uh, each year. But during the pandemic, it actually grew faster, 10%, 8%. And why is that? and it is the stimulus money. All this stimulus money that came in, enhanced unemployment insurance benefit, all that provided the extra income. What are people doing with this extra income? They're not spending. If you cannot go to a restaurant, well, you are not spending money. Arizona Cardinals, if you cannot go see the game in person, well, there's less economic activity. By the way, I just have to say this, uh, Arizona Cardinals is becoming one of my uh, favorite team. I live in close to Washington, D.C. And the reasoning for that is, just in case uh, you did not know, uh, I am of Korean ancestry. Uh, and Kyler Murray, uh, the quarterback, uh, just in case you don't know, he's half Korean. So I have to pull for my, uh, my guy out there. So anyway, uh, if you cannot see Arizona Cardinals in person, uh, then you know, spending is not there. So. People have additional income, but people have not been spending money, which means there's sizable savings. Once the vaccine is discovered, and it will be discovered, whether late uh, this year or early next year, it will be discovered, there is a potential for unleashing of all this spending money back into the economy, uh, because uh, you know, with vaccine, people will feel much more comfortable about traveling, uh, just getting back to normal life. So there's this potential of spending growth once the vaccine is discovered. But so far during this pandemic phase, let's try to see where people are spending and not spending. They're going to more beer liquor stores. And you may say, well, is this means trying to drown out the sorrows? And answer is actually people cannot go to bars. So they're just simply drinking at home rather than at bars. Online shopping is up, no surprise but maybe you did not know that it was up 20%. People are at home more often, so they're spending more for gardening and home remodeling. Home Depot CEO saying revenue growth completely surprising on the positive side. Sporting goods, you are bored, buying bicycles, maybe video games, that is up. People are not driving as much, not going to the restaurant, 
if you are not meeting many people in person, why do you need new clothes and gifts and souvenirs? I mean, just tanking uh, in that uh, area. What about paying rents? People have the income, are people paying rents? There are some social activists, loud social activists to say during the pandemic, cancel rent, encouraging tenants to say don't pay rent. So what are people doing? Back in 2019, when the economy was doing, uh, you know, it was running very, very uh, good, 90% of tenants were paying rent on time. That is during the normal good times. During the pandemic, the rent collection was 88%. And many apartment owners will say they are quite pleased with 88%. They thought it would go down much, much more. So what this is indicating is that Americans, for the large part, are saying, I will fulfill my obligations, contractual obligations. If I have the finances, I am going to pay the rent. Uh, so, so far, people have been paying the rent. But the question becomes, what happens in the upcoming months? Because the unemployment insurance amount, it will be a little lower uh, compared to what it had been. Uh, currently, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, President Trump, Mitch McConnell, they're trying to debate as to uh, what is the right amount for unemployment insurance. Uh, Nancy Pelosi wants generous amounts so people can pay rent, people can buy food, uh, while President Trump and Mitch McConnell is saying, no, that disincentivizes people from coming back to work. We need to assure that people have an incentive to come back to work. So they're trying to determine what the right amount is. And that's why the stimulus bill is still stalled in Congress at the moment. Good news, home sales is flying. First, during the lockdown, sales declined. But now it is up 10% compared to one year before. Many realtors would have said last summer was a very good year. August of this year, even better. In the midst of a pandemic, even with high unemployment rate, home sales just flying. New home sales, newly constructed home sales, up 40%. Whatever the builders build, they are easily able to find buyers. So very strong housing market condition. Pending contracts, up 20% from one year before, which assures that this autumn would be one of the strongest autumn sales uh, season of all time. So pending contracts running very strong. Even better news, what do realtors say to their clients to demonstrate seriousness? If you want to be serious about home buying, get a mortgage approval. So what are consumers doing? Mortgage application to buy a home. I excluded refinance data, and I hope you took the advantage of refinance, but I excluded refinance. This is mortgage application only to buy a home, and it is booming up 20, 30%, depending upon which week you select compared to one year before. So the very first phase of home buying process, getting the mortgage approval, getting the mortgages up solidly, implying plenty of potential buyers in the pipeline to hit the market, which means that this winter will be one of the best winter for housing sales than in history. So autumn will be good, winter activity also looks to be very, very sound. Home ownership rate is get thereby getting boosted. No surprise with so many buyers trying to take advantage of low interest rates, but take it with a grain of salt on the latest data point. I know home ownership rate is rising, but I doubt that it's spiking up like the data is showing on the chart. Why is that happening? Well, census changed their methodology. Normally, what census would do is randomly select a neighborhood knock on the door and ask, are you an owner or a tenant? And then if they see an apartment complex, they'll assume everyone is a tenant. Uh, and based on that, that's how they will compute home ownership rate. So what, are, what did they do in the second quarter, just the spiking up in home ownership rate? They changed the methodology. Because of COVID, they did not walk the street. Rather, they made phone calls. And using the phone call methodology, somehow, without a doubt, they're getting biased results. I don't know why, but there is a biased result. I wonder, all this presidential polling that is done, I mean, based on the latest data, it seems like uh, that Joe Biden would easily uh, win the presidential election. Uh, but there could be slight bias in that result as well as you know, polling data. 
on the home ownership rate is also implying. I don't know, you know, the, maybe uh, they did the right sampling and they accounted for many things, but the home ownership data certainly is showing, I think without a doubt, some bias uh, in getting the response, correct response. One constraining factor for housing market is just not enough homes for sale. There was an inventory shortage last year and we are continuing to face that. In fact, you can say it has intensified and we are, even, we are in an even more acute housing shortage. So we need more inventory. If we had 20 or 30% more inventory, home sales would be 20 or 30% higher. That's how strong the housing market demand is. We need more supply to match that demand. Are we going to get any inventory relief later in the year? And answer is definitively not, unfortunately. And here's why. How do we get inventory? We need more housing starts, meaning new home construction. And what is the home construction been? Well, this chart is 20 year line. You see sometimes it's above the orange line, which is the historical average that above was during the subprime lending boom. Uh, so builders overproduce and we had excess supply, prices plunge. Well, for the past 10 years, home builders have been underproducing. So any customer who say, are we going to see a repeat of what happened 10, 12 years ago? Your answer is no, we don't have oversupply. Back then builders built too many homes. Now builders are underproducing. But the cumulative effect of 10 years of underproduction is we just don't have homes for sale. So we need to have increased home building, more construction job. And what happens during the pandemic? In the first few months, governor said, go home, construction workers. Uh, don't be outside. But now the construction workers are back on construction site, but it's going to take several months to bring those homes to the market. So only in 2021, we may get some semblance of a balanced market. But for the remainder of this year, it looks like housing shortage, housing shortage. So depending upon whether you represent the seller, buyers, please keep in mind that housing shortage is with us for the remainder of the year. Only possibly sometime in 2021, we may get some relief, assuming that builders are able to build more, uh, find more construction workers. Completely new trend because of the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, only 5% of the workforce worked from home. Today, it's about one third. So because of that trend, we are seeing more interest in buying in the suburbs, rural areas, smaller towns, where homes are much more affordable, and away from city centers. The resort recreational area should be less than 10%, but now it's showing 13%. So there is some switch. Now we took a survey about their clients and their clients sometimes chose two locations and that's why the figures add up to be more than 100%. But so without a doubt, there's a trend towards suburbs and rural areas and smaller towns. So again, why live in Phoenix if you can work from home more frequently? Twitter has announced to their employees, you can work from home forever. Facebook believes half of their employees could work from home forever in the future. So if that's the case, why live in San Francisco in those small tiny homes costing $2 million? Why not go to Phoenix? Why not go to Prescott? Why not go to Flagstaff? First, you get an advantage of lower state income tax in Arizona, uh, and then you can buy a mansion. So if people do not have to work in the corporate headquarters, you may see this trend. I think for many companies, it will not be the, that extreme. I think in most companies, it will be something like come to office two days a week, other three days, you can work from home. So again, this is implying that people don't need to be so uh, worried about commuting and hence they can live further out into the uh, way. Here's an interesting chart. Home sales in vacation counties, counties where there's a lot of vacation homes, it is rising over 20% from one year ago, while other normal counties are rising only by 5%. Work from home also means work from vacation homes. So this trend developing, wow. So very interesting. I think this trend will be with us even after vaccine discovery. One of the silver lining related to the pandemic 
it simply accelerated some trend that may have occurred over the next 20 years, but simply compressed all that into a single year of 2020. Uh, and in fact, I would say that if the pandemic occurred five years ago, America's economy would have been crushed. Broadband access was not widely available. This type of Zoom technology would not be feasible. But given that we had broadband ready in 2020, uh, it made it possible. And also NAR is working hard to assure that rural areas have broader broadband access, wider broadband access, something that we are lobbying hard in Congress uh, to, to provide that service. Let me uh, now nearing the end, as people are going to the suburbs, just as a American history, I think we should all be mindful of it. The first wave of going to the suburbs was in the 1950s. This is the time when many middle-class family had automobile for the very first time. And then people said, Yahoo, I get to drive. There were a lot of excitement. So people said, I'm gonna go to the suburbs. I can, now I can drive, drive into my work. But many subdivisions had a explicit covenant to say you cannot sell a home to black Americans. So they denied the opportunity to build wealth from that time. Then the 1970s occurred, crime wave. People don't like crime. People say, no, uh, I'm gonna go out to the suburbs where it's much safer location. This third wave, I would put it as more work from home, permanent change. Keep in mind, before the pandemic, we had more minorities, Asians, Hispanic, African-Americans living in the suburbs compared to the city centers. So now that trend is occurring, we need to be mindful that the clients could be minority households. We need to show equal human dignity, equal respect. And not only is it about doing the right thing, but it's the law of the land. So if you violate it, you may even lose your license. But I, all of you follow the Realtor Code of Ethics, so I'm positive uh, that you can uh, continue to carry out the fair housing uh, laws. My final slide is home prices rising and rising. We have housing shortage. Many people say my home price forecast is too conservative. It's rising 8%, 9%, much faster than my numbers shown here. Home sales, even though we missed the spring buying season, second half is so strong, we're gonna easily make up for it. So 2020 will essentially match 2019. Then you go to 2021, home sales rising because economy will continue to recover, advance, and you have all this secondary order effect of working from home. Even people who are happy with their home before the pandemic, living in Phoenix, four bedroom house, now say this four bedroom is not sufficient. I need that fifth bedroom, sixth bedroom to turn it into office for myself and my spouse. So we are creating another new set of housing demand. So things are looking really good. And market backdrop, I mean, this looks uh, very good for uh, real estate. Bad news, commercial real estate. Commercial real estate as we've reflected in the REIT stock market is showing pain in lodging hotel, retail, uh, office spaces, but positive in industrial warehouses, like Amazon using the warehouses. Commercial transaction down tremendously. One report showing down 68%. So even though residential members are very busy, let's keep in mind our fellow commercial members, they're having some challenged uh, times. Commercial prices so far has yet to come down, but I think it's just inevitable that it will come down because vacancy rates are rising. I would put more challenges in the major cities like San Francisco, LA, New York, Washington. Phoenix, given the faster job growth, I think could be in a better situation. And also Prescott, even better because you are in the more distant small community where you will see even greater people working from home, making that residential move. So my forecast for the commercial, which is on the very bottom line, is that prices increase 2019. But in 2020, I think there's going to be about 10% shaving of those prices. And then 2021, some residual impact. This is using the all the commercial properties together. Some commercial property will naturally do better than others. Uh, but uh, this is for the na nation. Uh, Phoenix will hold on reasonably a little better. 
uh, and the Prescott also doing a uh, little better than uh, even Phoenix. So thank you for uh, listening. And now I am going to turn it back uh, over to Matt or Jeff. Thank you. So um, again, thank you, Dr. Young. That was fantastic. Uh, great information. I had actually pulled some people into my office. I just took my mask off before I went to video, so um, nothing there. But um, we were all sitting here watching on the big screen. So that was fantastic. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Next, I would like to welcome Keith Watkins. Keith, are you out there? Yes, sir. Okay. Take it away, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Matt and Amanda for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. I'll, uh, attempt to share my screen here. There we go. Uh, can we see that? Is everybody uh, able to see that? Yes. Okay, good. I, I did it right then. Right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Keith Watkins. I'm Senior Vice President of uh, Rural Development and uh, Legislative Affairs here at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Um, as an aside, I, I also am uh, a, a licensed real estate agent. I've had my license uh, since uh, 1988, which is kind of scary to me, but, uh, and I just finished my continuing uh, education hours, so I'm really happy uh, lately. Uh, the Arizona Commerce Authority, who are we? Uh, we are the state of Arizona's economic development arm. Uh, we are charged with uh, enhancing Arizona's job base, uh, through a, a variety of, uh, of methods. We are governed by a, a board of directors that consists of both public and, and private sector folks. Our chairperson or chairman is Governor Ducey. Uh, and uh, we have uh, just about 100 employees. Um, we also house the Office of Economic Opportunity. This is the group that crunches all of the numbers that get reported to Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, and they, they also produce the uh, unemployment rates for the state. Uh, so we are um, uh, it's really at the, at the crux of, of the data. Um, so how do we go about economic development here in, in Arizona uh, at the uh, Commerce Authority? We really, we really take a, a, a three-pronged approach. Uh, that is attracting uh, new companies from out of state to expand or relocate here. We also work with existing companies to expand their operations here. And then we've got a, a startup or entrepreneurial unit that works with uh, entrepreneurs in accessing capital and refining business plans uh, and the like. Um, it should be noted that um, we focus our work on what are considered base industry uh, jobs. Uh, base industry is anything that creates a product or service and exports it outside of its area of influence. Um, so export doesn't necessarily mean international, but it can. Uh, but if, if a company is in Prescott and it manufactures a widget and it sells it to somebody in Phoenix, that's ex exporting a product because the inverse of that is you're importing net new dollars to the Prescott area uh, economy. So um, the other way to say um, what base industry is, is it's, it's not retail, it's not uh, tourism or hospitality oriented. Um, so uh, for fiscal year 20, uh, which started last June, uh, we, uh, we have 133 projects in our pipeline that represent uh, just under uh, 25,000 jobs and uh, uh, approximately 15 billion in capital investment. Um, in uh, fiscal year 21 uh, here, we have uh, been able to secure 36 uh, commitments from companies that uh, project to create 7,800 jobs uh, at an average wage of 51,000 and uh, 900 million in capital investment. Incidentally, these are the metrics that we track. Uh, 
So um, you'll hear us talk a lot about those, those uh, metrics. Uh, so of, of these 36 projects, the question is how many of them are rural? So far, seven of them are rural, which represent uh, 544 jobs and 374 million in capital investment. COVID-19 has uh, upended all of our lives uh, this year. Um, and uh, we had to, to pivot rather quickly on uh, some of our uh, operations and, and uh, uh, business plans. And so some of the things that we did were, um, we leveraged our partnership with the Small Business Development Centers. Uh, in Prescott, the Small Business Development Center is housed at Yavapai Community College. And uh, they are largely funded by the SBA. And what, uh, what the approaches that we took was uh, one of outreach to small businesses to make them aware of programs that SBA had rolled out to assist them, namely uh, the PPP loans and the EIDL loans. And so you see on, on this slide here that for Arizona, there was a total of 239,000 loans approved for an amount of $12 billion. And then the breakdown of, of those 239,000 loans uh, was 85,771 for PPP, uh, 60,111 for idle, and then another 93,000 and change for the idle emergency advance. Um, it, it should also be noted that in Arizona, uh, there's a total of 595,000 businesses in Arizona, and uh, just about all of those are less than 500 employees. Uh, that is really a, a eye-opening number. Um, and the 485,000 of those 592 are uh, self-employed uh, individuals, uh, sole proprietors, if you will. Uh, and then 106,000 of the 485 has between one and 500 employees. Another thing we did, um, trying to be a purveyor of resources to, to the small business community, was we discovered this thing called the internet, which I'm told is going to stick around for a while. And then another little, little uh, toy called Zoom, uh, which we have all become rather adept at pretty quickly. And so we put together webinars. Um, we uh, started off doing them every day, and we, we uh, kept that pace up for about nine weeks. Uh, we've cut that back to two times a week now, um, and uh, we've done a total of 87 sessions uh, so far. And we try to bring uh, uh, presenters on that, that have uh, knowledge of resources or um, um, best practices for small businesses. Uh, we had a representative from the Target stores on to talk about uh, the things that they did um, for, um, to preserve um, the, the sanit sanitary environment for their stores and protect their workers. We also had somebody on from Starbucks that spoke in a similar fashion. Uh, we had lawyers on uh, talking about real estate, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so um, th those are some of the, the resources we, we tried to, to bring to the forefront. Um, I've begun a series of rural economic development webinars, um, also really targeted at the rural economic development community. Um, and the idea here is also to, to bring resources that the economic development community in rural Arizona may not uh, be aware of. Um, I'll be doing one next week on Tuesday the 13th, uh, where we'll have Andy Gordon from the Arizona Multibank on to talk about banking and what some of the underwriting standards are uh, in, this, in this new environment. Um, and so if anybody wants to join that, it's not limited to economic development folks. It's open to anybody. If anybody wants to join it, um, you can see the link down here below. So what does all of this mean? Um, I, I am uh, certainly not uh, a Dr. Yoon, whose presentation was excellent, I thought, um, but I'll, I'll give you a glimpse um, in, into what we're seeing. Um, as Dr. Yoon mentioned, we, we're at an unemployment rate of 5.9%. Uh, 
we added 80,000 jobs in August. Um, for, for Yavapai County, there's a 5.1% unemployment rate and then a higher rate uh, in Coconino County. Um, unemployment projections. Um, you can see where we are as a state here. Um, short term, we're, we're at about uh, 3.246 million. Uh, long term, uh, we look to, to ramp that up by about 300,000. And you have a Pike County. Uh, we're just at uh, under 75,000. And then the next, uh, geez, we're in 20, next eight years, um, we, we anticipate adding 10,000 more uh, jobs in Yavapai County with uh, another 6,000 in Coconino County. Um, question may be why, why is Coconino County only projected to grow by 6,000 jobs, especially when they're a bigger county? Uh, much of their, uh, their land area is, is not fee land. Um, they're landlocked by uh, the tribal uh, communities and uh, federal, uh, federal land and state land. Whereas Yavapai County uh, it has more fee land uh, available. Uh, population projections. Uh, it 20, by 2050, we, we anticipate having uh, about 10 million uh, population in Arizona with 300,000 of that uh, being in uh, Yavapai County uh, and then 163,000 in Coconino County. Home values, to tell you what you already know, um, and I'm sure um, you, can, uh, you can pick these numbers apart any which way, um, but uh, we see the, the median home value as 241,000 with uh, a median value in Yavapai County, 261,000. Uh, Coconino a little higher uh, because there's less supply in Coconino County, obviously. Um, so I'd be interested to know how close we are uh, to what, uh, what you, the experts, uh, are seeing uh, from, uh, from your uh, perspective on the ground in, uh, in the Prescott region. Um, with that, I thank you, and um, it's, uh, it's been an honor uh, to be here today uh, and uh, look forward to working with you. Hey, Keith, we yes. have a question that one of our people put in the chat box. Do you mind if sure. I read it, Keith? Please do. Okay, I'm trying to get it open. How much does the Commerce Authority work with the three state universities, and what is the interaction? We work with them um, constantly, um, and the interaction is, uh, it depends on um, what, what the topic is, obviously. For instance, we are heavily invested um, in the, um, the, autom the automation uh, arena. Um, we started something called uh, IAM, which stands for um, Institute for Automated Mobility, and this speaks to uh, self-driving cars, drones, those sorts of things. Uh, we're partnered with the three universities on that, as well as private industry, uh, such as Intel, State Farm, and others. Um, we also are engaged with universities and broadband. Um, most folks don't know that the three universities have their own broadband network and uh, that can also serve as a carrier. So we are heavily invested in trying to enhance the broadband connectivity to the rural areas. And um, we are uh, leveraging the state university um, internet system, they call it the Sun Corridor, um, to do some of that. Um, and then um, also as it relates to um, recruitment of, of our uh, companies to Arizona and the companies that expand here, um, there's certainly a tie-in uh, with the three universities. We worked with um, Lucid Automotive and Nicola to bring um, their automotive manufacturing plants down to Pinnell County. Uh, much of that manufacturing will be automated uh, through robotics and uh, ASU uh, has the um, ability to train those people at their Polytechnic campus. Uh, and so they're working um, hand in hand with those companies. So we get involved with them quite regularly.
Okay, yeah. I don't know if, uh, if Matthew, uh, is your volume up? I, I have a, uh, I did an injustice to Keith. I am so sorry. When I jumped in, I didn't introduce him. I just gave him the reins and let him go. But uh, for all of you that didn't know, uh, Keith Sears is, he, as he mentioned, the Senior Vice President of Legislative Affairs and Rural and Development for the Arizona Community Authority, um, and that's the ACA. He is also, in, in this capacity, Keith plays a vital role in the ACA's efforts to advance Arizona's rural ec uh, economies, as well as ever advising, sorry, the governor's office on rural economic development issues and opportunities while also managing the ACA's legislative affairs. So um, I, I didn't uh, introduce, <laughs> introduce all that, that Keith does, and I, I extremely apologize. I kind of stepped in there um, and uh, uh, skipped over, but he also, uh, uh, drives the state's job growth efforts, which uh, have resulted in 132,000 new announced jobs that represent over 14.5 billion in capital investments, as he brought up on the screen, and uh, to uh, Arizona and uh, in capital investments in Arizona since inception of the ACA. Um, and uh, so, additionally, Keith oversees the state of Arizona's broadband efforts, as he just mentioned has been ins instrumental in advancing the restoration of Arizona's forests and service, serves on the board of directors for the Water Infrastructure Finance Authority. I didn't know that. Uh, fantastic, a public bonding authority. I am so sorry, Keith, that I didn't give that uh, uh, beforehand, but um, it will be recorded. So that's good. That's <laughs> fine, Jeff, thank you. Um, uh, Matt, can you, can you speak? Yeah, I don't know if you better now or not. Matt, no. Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, thanks, Keith. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, and, Jeff. Uh, and uh, I apologize again. Um, so your presentation was informative and helpful for all of us, and we are so grateful that you were able to speak today at our, our uh, virtual uh, economic summit, you our bet. first one. So um, really excited about that. Uh, both you and, and Lawrence uh, did a fantastic job of presentations, and so I appreciate all the information. Uh, before we close, I would like to thank our association and Prescott Area WCR for helping us continue to have our economic summit in the, this new virtual climate. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation as much as I did, and uh, thank you all for joining us this morning for this very special event and hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Now, um, did I miss any comments in the chat, Amanda? Um, I do not think so. Thank you for everyone for saying thank you. We've had some comments about getting the um, copies of the slides. I'm not sure that we can get copies of the slides, but we have recorded the entire event, so we will have slides under that way where you can grab other pictures or recreate the information, et cetera, if you need to. Um, we had some problems going live today, so we didn't go live till in the middle, but we did record the whole event. So as soon as we have the recording up, please be on the lookout for the weekly update that goes out on Saturday because we should have a link there. We'll post it on Facebook, recess, et cetera, for all of you guys to catch up. And please share with the people who couldn't be here today because the market's hot. So share this video with them so that they can get that done as well. And, and, and that's Dan's uh, weekly update. So when you see that come Saturday, uh, that's all Dan's uh, uh, gathering of the week. So uh, we, I'll let you uh, take us out, Amanda. Um, thanks everyone for being here. We just appreciate you being here. I am so grateful to the Prescott Commercial Air Area Commercial Group for allowing us to um, partner with them on this this year so that we could do it as a virtual event because we all know 2020 has been full of challenges and um, opportunities. Um, and this has been another one. Um, very grateful to NAR for bringing Lawrence in with us. Very grateful to Commercial commercial group for bringing Keith and very thankful to all of our members both of the Prescott Area Commercial Group, the Prescott Area WCR and the Prescott Area Association of Realtors for joining us today for this great information. Um, if you have other ideas for great information or other types of information you would like to see us do please shoot me an email at amanda at paar.org and we'll bring it to you as soon as we can or do everything we can to. Thanks guys and have a great day. <laughs>